thank you so much for, um, I thank James, uh, Dean James Donald for the invitation. It's a great pleasure for me to have this opportunity to present some ideas on community and uh, to you and also to uh, Paul Patton for the kind presentation. But before I begin, I acknowledge the traditional owners of the land we meet on, the Gadigal people of the Aero Nation, and pay my respects to their elders, both past and present. So let me just go into the topic right away or into the paper. <clears throat> Over the last decades, we have witnessed dramatic changes in our understanding of what it means to live in community with others. The accelerated globalization of social and economic relations has generated new forms of community that are inherently paradoxical. There are two traditional understandings of community, distinguished by the German terms Gemeinschaft and Gesellschaft, translated as community and society. Both of these terms have undergone a radical change of meaning. In the understanding of community as Gemeinschaft, people want to be together because they feel that they share that they share something, a bit of common experience or history, some sort of national or tribal feeling, usually due to the fact that they were born on and share the same parcel of the earth. But in the age of globalization, people who have little or nothing in common with others stand in need of forming both virtual and real communities without, for all that, giving up their differences. So what does community now mean when the people that form it have nothing substantial in common, no shared territories, identities, or values? How can a bond between people be established when there's nothing that unites them? How can radical difference make for communal forms of life? Let's take as an example the kind of political activism made possible by Facebook and other social networks. Take the problem of bullying. Bullying has become an issue that moved extremely quickly from being a private torment for excluded teens and their families to a worldwide legislative and policy priority, in part thanks to the activism of pop stars like Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga offers a community with global reach to all those who feel excluded on the grounds of being considered freaks, losers, nerds, and so on. All those people who simply don't fit in. The only requirement to be part of this new community is to be a little monster, with Lady Gaga being the mother monster. Lady Gaga, without ever probably having read Kripke's theory of names, uses the same principle. To be part of this community, there's nothing you need to be essentially. All you need to have is been baptized with a name that singles you out for harassment, and without this harassment being due to anything you are, but simply because you are born this way, as Lady Gaga says. In short, you need to have nothing whatsoever in common with other members of Lady Gaga's community except the label Little Monster, except the fact of having been excluded from all other substantive communities. On the second traditional understanding of community as Gesellschaft, people want to be together because they derive an advantage from transacting with others. This usually takes the form of a contractual relation and the advantage is usually measurable in terms of money, that is, in terms of an economic advantage. In this understanding of community, what the individual members of a community owe to one another is contractually defined as a reciprocal relationship between equals. What I owe to you is exchangeable for what you owe to me. Now in the age of global economic crisis, the social relation to the other has become increasingly asymmetrical, where members of a community stand to each other in a relationship of infinite debt. So what, and I'm clearly not using <laughs> the so what the way it's supposed to use, be used, but <laughs> whatever. So what does it mean that nowadays people seek the community of others without thereby gaining any measurable advantage? What does it mean that community requires an obligation to give beyond measure? And how can communities preserve themselves at the cost of infinitely indebting their individual members? Let's take again uh, the example of, or let's take again an example, the example of the current European debt crisis. 
As you know, and despite of what you read in the Northern European sensationalist newspapers, the crisis would not, was not only caused by the Greek government having underplayed their indebtedness back when the euro began, nor is it only due to the fact that the Greeks are less industrious than the Germans, retire at a younger age, and so on. Rather, their banking system got settled with more bad debt, in part given to them by German and French banks, than those of other economies. The entry into the euro facilitated the Greek people to assume a debt that was not theirs to begin with. It turns out that the euro also prevents them from using the usual mechanisms to pay for this debt, forcing them to borrow money at rates that are impossible to recover from. To get out of this bind, it is now looking every day more likely that other taxpayer, taxpayers in the European Union, but mainly in Germany and France, will have to take on part of the debt of Greece and of other EU countries, a debt which is not theirs, and all of this in order to form a stronger financial community. Here the principle is that you pay for someone else's debt, you enter into a community with others, not in view of your private gain, but on the presumption that you will lose money, you will pay for debts, not of your own making. And it is on the basis of this calculated loss or risk that you hope to build up a future return. However, this return is incalculable. One cannot count on it at the moment of making the gift, that is at the moment of taking up someone else's bad debt. We are here exactly at the opposite extreme of a normal business transaction in which the return is already calculated in advance and this is what allows you to determine how much debt you need to incur in, how much credit you need to ask for. In both traditional understandings of community, the common bond is constituted primarily by language, independent, independently of whether by language we mean a given, spoken and lived practical idiom, or whether by language we understand an ontological entity, language as the house of being, as Heidegger says, or simply a coded exchange of information that establishes a basis for systematic, predictable behavior, as in Luhmann. Nowadays, in the age of man-made environmental crisis and ecological disasters, it has become evident that the human species needs to create communities and learn to be in community with other forms of species life. These communities obviously can no longer be based on the assumption that all participants share the same human language. Instead, it is a shared biological life that seems to be the unifying force between a shared biological continuum. So what does community now mean when the relationship to another becomes transhuman? when it is a question of relating to other forms of life. How do we live in common or communicate with other forms of species life without being able to exchange either words or reasons? An example of this predicament is given every day by the industrial production and processing of food. As you know, in industrial farms, animals are treated in completely inhuman ways in particular, what causes us to say paradoxically that animals are treated inhumanly is the fact that their living conditions are such that animals can have no possible community or common form of life. In the case of chicken, for example, animals are so crowded that the proverbial packing order is entirely destroyed and so on. As a result of these inhuman conditions for animals, animal diseases have developed from mad cow disease to avian flu, that begin in other species but turn out to be transmissible and infect in deadly ways our own species. By destroying the possibility of community of and with other species, it seems we generate disease, diseases that destroy us. To sum it up, we can say that what is at stake in these new forms of community are three paradigm shifts. First, a shift from the idea that we have in common is some, uh, the idea that what we have in common is some essential feature that is shared by all members of the community to the idea that the only thing common to all is that we have no common essence, that community depends on labels, on names, and not on true descriptions. Second, there's a shift from a social contract model to a practice of gift giving, 
where the reciprocal obligation to give without return becomes the constitutive feature of social life. Third and last, a shift in the presupposition of community from the fact of language to the fact of life, because it is this last fact that allows us to think about forms of community that engage with other living species. In what follows, I shall briefly illustrate these three paradigm shifts in three distinct parts. First, community and singularity. Second, community and gift giving. And third, community and biopolitics. Let me begin community and singularity. The idea that difference or singularity binds people who otherwise have nothing in common to each other is without doubt inspired by the work of the French philosopher Georges Bataille, who faced with the crisis of mass totalitarian society already in the 1930s called for a community of those who do not have a community. Almost 50 years later, his compatriot Jean-Luc Nancy published a reflection on Bataille under the title The Inoperative Community, which was followed by the response of Maurice Blanchot in The Inavowable Community. Shortly thereafter, the Italian philosopher Giorgio Agamben, in a book entitled The Coming Community, also engaged this conversation. In European continental philosophy, this discussion is now being referred to as the new thinking about community. Nancy, Blanchot, and Agamben all hold on to the Bataille idea of singularity as the constitutive feature of community. But they make participation in a community undergo what could be called a linguistic turn. In particular for Nancy and Agamben, it is before all Heidegger's idea of language as the house of being that plays a crucial part in our experience of community. Agamben, for, for instance, claims that what drives humanity, quote, towards a single common destiny is the alienation from linguistic being, the uprooting of all peoples from their vital dwelling in language, end of quote. quote. And he goes on to say that only those who succeed in bringing language itself to language will be the first citizens of a truly open and inclusive community. The general argument of these thinkers is as follows. Something is considered to be part of a group of similar things because of the name they share. But this name itself is not part of the group. The fact of their grouping or commonality is not due to anything that these things are or share. In other words, what allows us to speak with others is the effect of language that can never be put into words. Hence the paradox that the name in, word, in virtue of which I'm included in this or that group picks out a singularity whereby I'm excluded from all defined groups. From here follows the conclusion that a truly inclusive community will be a community of the excluded from all communities, a community of the incommunicable, a community of silence. Roughly during the, those same years, in the Anglo-American Anglo context, the debate between liberalism and communitarianism also uh, was raging, and at the heart of this debate stands the question of community. On one side of the debate, we find Charles Taylor's communitarian conception of politics, and on the other side, a liberal conception of communicative reason defended by both Rawls and Habermas. For Taylor, what distinguishes a community is its cultural identity. On this view, what we owe one another is love understood as those common or shared ways of feeling about some set of cultural values that inseparably bind the individual members of a community to each other. For Taylor, who we are is determined by what we can love together with others. Since we cannot really love together with all other human beings, but only with this or that group, no set of universal values as such can become the basis of a given community. One can only love together with others a concrete form of life, a concrete instantiation of values, so universalism and communitarianism remain at odds. Furthermore, on this view, I can never ultimately justify my belonging to one community to someone who does not share my passionate understanding of the values of that community. My belief that somehow these values, even if I cannot say why, are true or authentic for me. In contrast, contrast to Taylor's politics of identity, Habermas develops an idea of community 
based on the idea of communicative action. To be in community with others means to come to an understanding about the rightness of something. In this exchange, when I tell you something, I'm always implicitly asking you to ask me for the reason, for the justification of what I said. What we owe each other on this view is basically reasons that are acceptable both to me and you, that is, public reason. This idea of public reason is found across post rawsian political thought. In this liberal idea of community, we owe each other good or public reasons for being together. Or put in another, another way, one is together with someone else only for some good reason. What is striking to me is that whether we are talking about community in contemporary French and Italian philosophy or in the recent Anglo-American debates, in both cases the fact of community is conceived through the fact of language and as a result we are dealing in all cases with humanist conceptions of community. Whether we center our attention on the phenomenon of naming as in the Heideggerian tradition or on the phenomenon of justification as in the pragmatic tradition, in both cases language is what distinguishes rather than includes human beings from other living species. In his last lecture course, Derrida pointed out that in Genesis, even prior to human fallenness and guilt, language is already an instrument of domination linked with man's presumption to name other animals. But the post-analytical tradition does know better, since there's an intrinsic speciesism in the identification of the human being as the animal with reason, the animal that employs argument. arguments. In my opinion, as mentioned above, all conceptions of the communal bond that are based on the belief, so predominant during the last century, that language alone can make sense of the world, that the world is linguistically construed, are insufficient insofar as they are incapable of providing an answer to the need for communal relationships with other forms of species life. In my view, we need to work towards a transhuman conception of community, where the question of community is investigated from the perspective of life rather than of language and perhaps even allow us to question the value of language for life rather than the other way around. Similar, similarly, despite their great differences, the post-Heideggerian and the post-analytical conceptions of community have not really gone beyond the social contract model. Whether we owe each other public reasons or common love, we owe it to each other in equal measure. Inclusion in a community is to be sought after on equal terms and for equal benefit. Even in a community of singulars, it is the equal singularity of each that makes possible their being in common. In all these cases, community is something we want in order to share a burden, relieve us of a debt, and in that sense, we ask of community to make us whole again. If we are to move towards a new conception of community, then it is necessary to question the relation between community and debt as understood by the social, social contract tradition. This leads me to the second part of the paper, community and gift giving. Although the new thinking about community in Nassi, Blanchot and Agamben may not escape entirely the social contract tradition, nonetheless their discussions have the great merit of pointing out that being in community with others should have no ulterior purpose. If we enter into community with others to get something out of it, then we're not really in, in common with others. There's no common there at all, but at best a mutual self-benefit. All of these thinkers reject the sociological and economical idea that communities are essentially a product of the division of labor, the belief that we need others in order to satisfy our own needs. On the contrary, all of them point out that true community is somehow an effect of poverty, a mutual gift of pure loss, of pure loss, at the opposite extreme of the capitalist belief that if everyone pursues their own gain, this will eventually lead to a common benefit to a better community. This anti-economical feature of community has been recently developed by the Italian philosopher Roberto Esposito. He traces the term community back to its original Latin root, 
where he discovers that munos in community, no, comunidad, refers to the priority of debt, duty, or obligation and gift. On the basis of this etymological finding, he concludes that community means a reciprocal obligation imposed on the individual members of the community to stand to each other in a relationship of gift giving. The reciprocal obligation of gift giving leads him to another characteristic of community, which is tied to its inhospitality to the claims of individual self-preservation. Human beings have always rightly associated the fact of community with the threat of violence. The violence inherent to community is related to its incapacity to preserve the life of its members. Given that community was never made for the sake of its members, then what led to the idea that community helps us attain our individual perfection and salvation? Esposito again returns to the term munos, but this time in order, to, in order to see it as the root of the idea of immunity. If community is our outside, immunization is what brings us back within ourselves by cutting off all contact with the outside, by freeing us from all debt towards the other. Immunity from the claims of community is what turns our condition of infinite debt to others into a condition where the other is a partner in an exchange of services in view of mutual gain or self-interest. In this sense, all the modern political and legal categories that came out, come out of the idea of a social contract reveal themselves to be not the reflection of human nature, characterized by egoism and individualism, but to the contrary, historically determined Human, un, immunitary devices intended to dispossess us of the common, of that which belongs to no one. Private property, what is most one's own, is not a natural condition. It is a paradoxical result of the dispossession of common dispossession. It is the result of taking away our common poverty. According to Esposito, the challenge of our time is how to establish an affirmative relation between these two elements of community, the element of the debt and the gift of the other versus the element of equal exchange with others and immunity from them. Moreover, the goal is to understand the interrelation of these two elements on the basis of life rather than of language. And this leads me to the third and last part of this lecture, community and biopolitics. For Esposito, the plausibility of this biopolitical turn is due to the fact that the above meanings of community and immunity are closely related to the features of biological life. For any living entity, the life process is something that begins and ends outside of itself. Metabolism presupposes that life is always directed to an outside which it is constantly incorporating and an inside which it is always rejecting or casting off. This is akin to the relation between self and community as the outside of individuals that maintains them and destroys them at the same time. Likewise, living things develop self-protective devices to attenuate or control their dependence on the outside. And these devices are known both in biology and jurisprudence as immunities. Now, in order to think the relation between that community and immunity have with each other from a perspective of life, Esposito, like Derrida, suggests we, uh, we pay special attention to the phenomenon of autoimmunity. He argues that autoimmunity can have two different and opposing developments characterized respectively by the openness and the closure of life towards the other. Thus two possibilities appear on the scene once community is thought in biopolitical terms. In the first possibility, the idea of immunity necessary for the protection of individual life is carried past a certain threshold or limit and ends up attacking itself. Let late modern politics reveal from this perspective a tremendous rise of levels of immunity against otherness. The rise of immunity corresponds to the processes Foucault identified as the ever more intense and direct in government of politics over human life. 
once the life of the human species becomes the object of political preservation and thus of immunization, one conclusion becomes inevitable that some so-called higher or more valuable form of life can be preserved only at the cost of killing other lower or less valuable forms of life. This is the development of biopolitics towards a thanatopolitics or politics of death. In the second possibility, the discourse of biopolitics does not necessarily have to end in the destruction of life. If the task of immunizing life itself is what drives modern politics into its totalitarian tailspin, then it is just possible that having let life into politics, we must learn to let life show us how to protect ourselves from too much protection and immunization. The idea of autoimmunity has the remarkable property of describing a process of destruction of individuality, which at the same time harbors the preservation of this individuality. The example Esposito chooses to illustrate this other sense of autoimmunity is the lowering of the defenses in the mother's body in order to be more hospitable to the fetus. Apparently, the more the genetic makeup of the fetus is different from that of the mother's, the more the mother's immunitary devices are lowered rather than heightened as one would expect from a pure logic of self-preservation. Thus, against the self-destructive tendency of immunity, immunity must be made not a barrier of separation, but a filter of relation, which is what calls on it from the outside. Let me illustrate this reciprocal relation between community and immunity by returning to our Eurozone debt crisis example. As you know, the crisis is lived as an immunitary crisis where supposedly healthier economies don't want to be infected by the deaths of the so-called weaker economies. The stronger economies react by rising, raising their levels of immunity to the point of unleashing an autoimmunitary chain reaction. The very solidarity to weaker European lands that was the basis of the creation of the euro in the first place is now seen as its greatest threat. This implosion in turn causes global investors not to trust in the euro, depriving Europe of the credit that it needs to grow and so on. Now my point is that there's another affirmative way to understand this autoimmunitary crisis. The European community needs to live up to its name and activate the logic of the MUNOS by lowering the barriers against supposed infections and engage in more risk-taking by assuming debts that are not one's own, as I say, supposedly. At the same time, the principle of immunity needs to be acted upon in terms of the willingness of the weaker economies to be inoculated by adopting some practices of the stronger economies, practices that were, that were until recently shunned on the ground, grounds that they were too foreign to the national custom and traditional ways of life. The same reciprocal relationship between community and immunity, where community refers to a, a radical openness to difference and immunity refers to a radical openness to being contaminated by this difference, needs to be applied to the problem of freedom. What we have defined modern freedom through the terms of two immunitary devices, those of subjective rights and of personhood. However, this definition of freedom forgets the double meaning of freedom as love and friendship, according to which friendship, according to freedom exists in and as community and not as an individual possession to be conquered and defended. The original root of freedom from the Indo-European Luth contains no reference to an absence of interference as in the modern idea of subjective freedom, but instead refers to a biological movement of expansion, blossoming or common growth that brings separate individuals together. In other words, it restores the meaning of freedom to the horizon of a common life. However, restoring the common dimension of freedom does not mean giving up its individual dimension. On the contrary, freedom designates the singular dimension of community, the part of community that resists immunization, that is not identical to itself and that remains open to difference. Thus, in the experience of freedom, community refers to difference 
and immunity to relation or contagion. Let me illustrate this point by taking a look at the category of personhood. Esposio traces the category of the person back to its Christian and Roman origins, where he discovers that this category cannot fill the gap between humanity and rights. Rather, the very category of personhood produces and widens the gap between these terms. In fact, etymological and genealogical analysis reveal that the category of the person is based on a double separation. It first divides human life into a personal and an animal life, and second, the category draws a dividing line within the human individual, separating an irrational part that needs to be dominated and ruled over by a rational part. Those who are incapable of such self-rule are not worthy of accessing the category of personhood. Accordingly, Esposito concludes that every attribution of personality always implicitly contains a reification of the impersonal biological layer from which it distances itself. Only when human beings can be assimilated to things does it become necessary to define others as persons. Against the self-protective exclusion of animal life, Esposito draws on Gilles Deleuze's idea of becoming animal of the human being and argues for what be, could be called a transhuman politics of life, which brings to light the animal and the human being. Let me illustrate what I mean by returning to the example of industrial farms, and I'll conclude on this example. As mentioned, industrialized farming leads to autoimmune diseases which begin in animals and then are transferred to human beings. That such a contagion is at all possible is clearly also due to the fact that animals are treated like persons in the sense that each animal is cut off from its communal form by being squeezed into a pen or in force fed, for example, much as if they were persons cut off from their animal, li uh, uh, animal life. Interesting enough, this new animal person is pumped up with immunities, that is, with antibiotics, etc., etc. The point here is that our treatment of animals is inhuman because it is too personalized, too human. The result is that when we do eat animal products, we are not really eating animals, but these person animals, that is, we're eating ourselves. Instead, the way forward would be to lower the immunities of animals, which means allow them to lose their personality by returning them to a communal form of life not just by themselves, but with all other animal species, including our own. Vice versa, humans need to inoculate themselves with animality. We need to start to break down massively all the artificial and spiritual illusions with which we have sought to separate ourselves for purposes of self-preservation from other living species. Let's put it this way. If any species wants to eat another living species, then it should only eat another animal with whom it has understood itself to have had a long-lasting, sustainable interaction and thus have lived with it in common for some time. Wittgenstein once said, if the lion could speak, we would not understand it. Well, I suggest it may be time to give it a try. So, and think, which would mean rethink what it could mean to create a new community with animals. I think this would entail rethinking the sense in which our security is based on human animals being predatory and dangerous to other living species. And now I can't help it, but as a Nietzschean, I have to, of course, cite Nietzsche at least once at the end. Um, in an aphorism entitled New Domestic Animals, Nietzsche tries to unsettle this anthropocentric idea of security and rights. I want my lion and eagle around so that I can always have hints and forebodings to how great or small my strength is. Must I look down to them and fear them, like will they eat me? And will the hour return when they look up to me in fear and maybe I might eat them? <laughs> Thank you.